Today we are going to continue our discussion about atoms. As we progress through the notes today, keep these questions in mind. By the end of the class, you should be able to answer each of these questions. Go ahead and pause the video so that you can write them down to reflect upon later. Let's begin today with a thought exercise. First, how would you explain the difference between an atom and an element? For example, we could compare gold atoms, which is observed at the nanometer scale, to gold ore, which can be observed at the centimeter scale or larger. An atom is the smallest unit of an element. When we talk about atoms, we are talking about the properties of those individual nanoscale entities. When we talk about an element, we are referring to the macroscopic sample, which has bulk properties. The scales of these are vastly different, as are the properties. Note that uh, gold atoms are not actually gold in color. Up to this point in history, the existence of atoms was not well accepted. That was in part because atoms are too small to see and in the 19th century, there was no direct experimental evidence for the existence of atoms. However, a very clever and self-taught scientist, John Dalton, proposed a theory describing the properties of atoms based on how elements combine to form compounds. He proposed that elements are composed of small, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms essentially picturing atoms as hard spherical balls. All atoms of an element are identical and have the same mass and properties. So every atom of hydrogen is exactly the same to every other atom of hydrogen. Atoms of a given element are different from atoms of other elements. So each element has atoms that are different than other elements but we don't know why elements are different from one another under Dalton's theories. Compounds are formed by combinations of atoms of two or more elements. This is a different picture of compound formation from the Greeks. And finally, chemical reactions are due to the rearrangement of atoms. Atoms uh, are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical reaction. Uh, this is essentially stating that matter is conserved in a chemical reaction. So what differs between the Greeks model and Dalton's model is that the Greeks believe that the shape of the atoms determined the material's properties, while Dalton believed that the composition or the types of atoms determined the material's properties. Essentially, Dalton saw atoms as playing a different role. Our understanding of atoms did not significantly change for nearly a century after Dalton published his atomic theory. In that time, one important technological advancement helped to propel future discoveries about the atom, electricity. In 1897, J.J. Thompson used electricity to discover electrons. He was later awarded the Nobel Prize for his discovery. Uh, and the years are not necessarily important for this class, but let's take a closer look at how Thompson discovered the electron. Thompson used an instrument called a cathode ray tube in his experiments. A cathode ray tube is a glass tube that emits particles from a cathode that move toward an anode because of a strong voltage applied to the plates. There is a hole in the anode that allows a beam of these particles to pass through. Thompson at first didn't know what these particles were, but by passing a beam through a set of electrically charged plates, he could measure the deflection of the beam caused by the plates. The animation here shows how the beam deflects in response to the charge on the plates. Thompson noticed that the beam always deflects toward the positive plate and away from the negative. Therefore, the particles in the beam must be negatively charged. Thompson measured the deflection of the beam as a function of the voltage of the plates to determine the mass of the deflected particle. At the time, the lightest known particle was hydrogen, 
but Thomson found that the beam was about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen. This was the first measurement of a fundamental particle and the first evidence of particles smaller than an atom. We talk about these experiments because they provide evidence for atoms and the structure of atoms. And this is how we know what we know. Essentially, Thomson's experiment showed um, that particles emerged from one disk, the cathode, and moved to the other disk, the anode. These particles could be deflected by electrical fields in a direction that would indicate that they were negatively charged. The particles could also be deflected by magnetic fields. The particles carried an electrical charge, allowing the beam to bend due to the magnetic field that it passed through. And the metal that the cathode was made of did not affect the behavior of the ray, so the composition of the ray appeared to be independent of the element that it came from. Since the particles always had the same mass to charge ratio, Thompson concluded that whatever made up the beams must exist in all atoms, and therefore atoms must be divisible. Thompson's discovery suggested that Dalton's model of the atom, the billiard ball model, needed to be changed. Rather than being an indivisible particle, the atom must contain electrons that can be emitted. Since electrons were found to be negatively charged, and atoms are neutral, the rest of the atom must be positively charged. Thus, Thomson's model of the atom included a positively charged mass with electrons embedded in the atom. Similar to the way that raisins are embedded within plum pudding. I don't particularly like plum pudding, so I think of it more as a chocolate chip cookie dough kind of model. Remember, the plum pudding and chocolate chip cookie dough are not models of the atom, they are just analogies to help you remember the features of the model. Now that Thomson had provided evidence of electrons, the next major mystery to solve was where are they? This leads us to Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford and his students conducted an experiment where they directed a beam of alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. An alpha particle is a helium atom nucleus. It contains two protons, positively charged particles, and two neutrons, neutral particles, and therefore is positively charged. Of course, Rutherford didn't know what an alpha particle was at the time. Alpha particles were just produced from a radioactive source and were ejected with a significant amount of energy as radioactive nuclei decay. The alpha particles were directed from the radioactive source toward an extremely thin piece of gold foil. Most of the alpha particles went straight through the film, but a very small fraction were deflected, some almost straight backwards. If the plum pudding model were to hold true, we would expect all the particles to pass through the atom. However, this is not what Rutherford observed. Most of the particles in Rutherford's experiment passed through, but many of the alpha particles were deflected, and some were even deflected straight back to the beam source. Essentially, what Rutherford's gold foil experiment showed is that the atom is mostly empty space, and that a small, positive, dense nucleus exists in the center of the atom. If you want to explore this further, check out the Rutherford appellate and the supporting materials. Rutherford's model is known as the planetary model, with electrons traveling in circular orbits around a positively charged nucleus. Although this model made several advancements from the plum pudding model, there was still much room for further development. Classical mechanics predicts that an orbiting electron will lose energy and spiral into the nucleus, causing the atom to implode. So, circular orbits are not stable. Rutherford acknowledged that this model was incorrect, but it fit with the experimental evidence and was the best that anyone could develop with the evidence available at that time. So where in the atom are the electrons, and are they moving? We will come back to that.
At the discovery of the nucleus came the discovery that it was composed of protons and neutrons. Neutrons were discovered in 1932, but were very difficult to detect. This is because they were neutral in charge. So if the electrons are not orbiting, where are they and how do they behave? Our current understanding of the atom resembles something like what is shown here, with a very small, dense nucleus in the center of the atom and electrons existing in a cloud outside of the nucleus. Some key points to remember about this model of the atom is that it is, it is electrically neutral. It has a small nucleus composed of protons and neutrons. And electrons are located in a cloud outside of the nucleus, which takes up most of the space of the atom. Notice that electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive charge, and neutrons are electrically neutral. Remember that this model isn't perfect, and we will continue to refine it as we learn more about how atoms behave throughout the course. As a final note, remember to return to the questions from the beginning of the video to reflect on how you might respond.